Hello, Motivation Family, it's Shade, and I'm so excited that you guys tuned in today. I hope you're ready to take some notes because we have an amazing message prepared for you guys, but I'm not gonna say too much, let's get right into it. Uh, but as we get into this and really pick up um, this last part of Romans chapter one, um, there are three bad categories that people fall into, three bad categories that people fall into. I want you to write these down. There's three of them, but I'm going to focus on one today. Um, number one, the unrighteous. All of us fall in one of these three groups. Number one, the unrighteous. Number two, the self-righteous. How many self-righteous people in here? Raise your hand. See, you don't even raise your hand. So, so this is the next group, the over-righteous. We have the unrighteous, we have the self-righteous, then we have the over-righteous. Bump somebody and tell them, you're doing too much. You go ahead and tell her, yeah, it's the over-righteous. Right. But today we're going to focus on uh, the unrighteous. Because the Bible talks about this wrath of God and how it falls uh, because, or the, the wrath of God comes because of the unrighteousness of sinful people. And God sends us wrath as a result. Paul begins to write because he talks about how God makes himself known to his people. As a matter of fact, not just to his people, but he makes himself known to all uh, humanity, all creation. And John MacArthur, I don't really agree with him all the time. Really, most of the time I don't. But Pastor John MacArthur shared something that I think is worth sharing with you. I'm going to borrow it from him today. But there's five wraths that he explained, I actually thought they were really good. Write these down. Number one, and then we're going to get to the gooder stuff. Number one, uh, he, he called it the five wraths of God. It's eternal wrath, the eternal wrath, okay? The eternal wrath is the punishment. It's the wrath of God that God applies at the great white throne of judgment. That's the last judgment God is ever going to do at the great right, white throne. That is the eternal wrath, okay? And then you have the eschatological Dang, that's a hard one. Eschatological. It's not even flowing right. Es eschatology. It's really talking about the wrath of God, his wrath uh, at the end of the world that Jesus talks about in Revelation. Then you have the catastrophic wrath. That is the wrath that comes from natural disasters like tsunamis or volcanoes or earthquakes. All right? And then you have... Uh, this one is really uncomfortable, the consequential wrath. That is the wrath that comes from the consequences of your decisions. That's the consequential wrath. And then this is the one we're really going to lean into today, and I really want to get your attention because I don't really hear people talk about this. and Maybe you've never heard people talk about this, uh, and I think it'll get your attention. But he talks about the abandonment wrath of God. This is the wrath of God when God lets you go. Oh, we love grace. We love mercy. But what happens when God lets you go? In Romans chapter 1, verses 23, uh, 24 through 32, we're going we're gonna to lean into this. It's getting good already. Anybody like it already? Okay, so let's look at the screen. You can write it down, and I'll read it for the sake of time. But it says, so God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things that their hearts desired. And as a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. That is why God abandoned them. Oh, God, let's look at that again. That is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women... Oh, God, even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men. And as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do the things that should never be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, 
greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning and disobey their parents. They refuse to understand, break their promises, are heartless, and have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die, yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. Today, I'm going to do part two of this series, Roaming Through Romans, part two called A Culture of Chaos. A Culture of Chaos. Now, I want to encourage you, we have Children's Church for a reason, and I might say some stuff that makes you uncomfortable, and that's my job. And if you don't don't feel uncomfortable sometimes, I'm not doing a good job. And I'm okay if you look at me with disdain for some of the things I'm going to challenge you with. But I didn't write this Bible. I just read it. And so I promise it's going to be hard, but it's going to be good by the time it's over with. How, how we see the world and how we see humanity is different than how God sees it. Most people think that people are inherently good. Like most people don't think people are just bad. People think if somebody's bad, it's because something had to have happened to them for, for them to act that way or to be that way. Most people don't think people are just born evil. But what I'm learning is the more I'm reading the word of God, I'm learning that God's perspective is actually the opposite, that we are inherently bad. We're inherently sinful. We're inherently dark. We're inherently disgusting in God's presence. Y'all like, this is not the message I came to hear today. What else about me, Pastor Jay? Let me tell you since you asked. God sees our life, and he sees the way that our heart is, and he calls us wicked. And let me tell you, we have to be careful about how we even judge ourselves. The Bible says if you judge yourself, you won't even be judged. Why? Because we'll have a grace for ourselves that we don't give to other people. We will condemn people to hell and jail for the same stuff, not only that we did, but that we're currently doing on the law. But God says, that because of this, he says, your heart is so deceptive and wicked that who knows it? You don't even know your own heart. You don't even know how wicked it is. Your heart plays you. I know you think you know you, but you don't know you like God knows you. And I don't have to know things about you because I know me and I know things about me and I know things about our humanity. And even within our humanity, God says on a good day, your good day is still wickedness. Your goodness is still, your, your, your righteousness is like filthy rags to me. So it tells us a lot about us and it tells us a lot about our sinful nature, how sin just is natural to us. The very things that God says stay away from and don't do are the very things that we run to. It's the very things that we're attracted to that we desire sometimes the most. God begins to show us our heart. And Pastor Gary Hamrick said something I thought was amazing. He said, the heart of the problem is a problem of the heart. The heart of the problem is a problem of the heart, which means that most of our issues and our things that we're dealing with within our sinful nature and our humanity is not really about the habit. It's more about the heart because your habit will change if your heart does. The problem is many of us are trying to change habits that our heart hasn't changed about. That's why you're fighting. You're fighting because you keep trying to stop doing something that your heart really wants. But when your heart begins to change about some stuff, your habits will follow it. I'm not suggesting that it's an easy thing to break, but I am saying it's breakable. There are some things we might die and go to heaven and we'll leave this earth struggling with. But there are some things that will leave this earth and God can deliver us from. But the question is, do you really want to be delivered? I, I know you're giving me the amens. Now it's Sunday. You're supposed to. I'm preaching. You're supposed to say amen, preach, pastor. You're supposed to nod. You're supposed to, yeah, give me the fist. You're supposed to do all of that stuff. You're supposed to, yeah, preach. You're supposed to do that. But what happens when your habit meets you in the car when church is over? 
What are you doing? What are you doing? How are you handling your habits? How are you managing this thing? And that's what we're really going to look at today and we're going to deal with because the thing is God gives every person free will. Everybody say free will. Those are two dangerous words to put together, free will, which means God gives us the ability to make a decision to obey him or disobey. What I've learned about God, he's never going to make you do something. When God has a plan and purpose for your life, he'll allow certain things to happen and put you in situations to be like, all right, you're going to learn from this. But there are some people that are so hard-headed that even when God puts them in situations and they've learned and they know God brought them through, they will still go back to the same stuff that God delivered them from. And the question is why? Because their heart hasn't changed. And rather than deal with your behavior, we really need to focus on more heart transplants in the church. Really need to deal with some other things. Because the truth is, many of us love talking about the grace of God. We love talking about the mercy of God. We talk about God's grace and how it follows us. His grace and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. We're like, woo, that's my word. That's my message. We love that stuff. We love talking about God's forgiveness. We love talking about how God is the God of a second chance and a third chance and a fourth chance and a million chance. We love that side of God. We love God's love. Right, right, right. We love it. We love when God takes it easy on us. We love when God smooths things over, when God looks over our stuff and gives us another chance. We love that kind of God. Yeah. But there's another side of God. That many of us don't understand. We don't really understand the God that we're dealing with because many of us subscribe to a cultural perspective of God and not a biblical perspective of God. And there's a difference between culture and Christ. There's a difference between what the Bible teaches us and what community and culture teaches us. And as much as we serve a God of love, we still serve a God of wrath. And the weight and the amount and the intensity of God's love, it's the same weight and amount and intensity of his wrath. And it's so serious and severe that that's why the Bible says in 1 Peter, it talks about how God's desire is that no man should perish. That God wants everybody to come to repentance. So God is not slow. He's not slothful. God is not slow in his coming. He's just trying to give us an opportunity. He's showing us more grace. Imagine if God came 10 years ago. Imagine if he came two weeks ago. Imagine if God came when you were where you were at. Wherever you're at was. (laughs) Wherever you were at. But imagine if God came there, but no, his grace was demonstrated and shown in his patience. We got to understand this wrath thing because Paul is writing to a group of people. And this people that he's writing to, we talked about last week. But when I first read this, I used to think it was a bunch of pagans and a bunch of heathens and a bunch of people far from God that he was writing about and talking about. He turned them over. But as I studied this, I learned it wasn't people that were far from God. It was people that claimed him. It was people that had the tattoo in the Jesus piece. It was people that had the what would Jesus do bracelets. Had their favorite scripture tatted on their back. It was those people. It was the people that attended church every week. Some of them were preachers. Some of them were musicians. Some of them were singers. Some of them just came to church with motivation gear on. It was them. And Paul's writing to them. And he's like, what's wrong with y'all? Do you understand who our God is? And he begins to write and he begins to show them something about God that they continue to overlook because all they wanted to do was hear about the love of God. And he says, listen, there was a group of people that God said, I'm done. There was a group of people that God said, you know what? You want it so bad, you can have it. Oh, you want that? You can have it. You can be God for a day. God let them be who they want it to be. And so I want to talk about it because today we're living in a culture of chaos. We're living in a culture that has completely disrespected God. And I want to really talk about this because moving God from culture is moving safety from it. 
Many of us don't really understand the safety and the protection that God actually provides by his presence. And so I really want to deal with this, and we're going to talk about the fruit of the faithless. I'm going to share six things with you today, and then you can go have brunch. But I want to share the six things, the fruit of the faithless. Paul begins to write about this, and he starts, and here's the framework. The framework is this. It's all idolatry. He says when you begin to worship everything but God, it's idolatry. Now, I see y'all looking at me with your Sunday face, and it's 2024, and I know what you're thinking. You don't have a little Buddha statue. You don't have a little mannequin in your house that you're worshiping some image. So you don't think idolatry applies to you. You don't think it applies to you because you don't have some type of graven image in front of you. But idolatry is not so much just about some dead person that you somebody created or a statue. Some of us idolize our jobs. Some of us idolize our relationships. How do I know I'm idolizing something? The very thing I prayed about that God gave me, now it's the very thing I use to neglect the God who gave it to me. Wow. It's interesting that you could come every Sunday and pray for something, and then God gives it to you, and now you're too busy for God with the thing that he gave to you in the first place. That's idolatry. Anything that you put before God or equal to God or compared to God has become your idol. You might not have trinkets with its name on it. You might not have figures hanging up, but you got some idols in your life. Every one of us daily have to make a decision to put down some type of idol. How do I know? Because every day I have to choose God. Doesn't matter how saved you are today. Tomorrow you're going fa- to be faced with some decisions to have to choose him again. And the next day and the next day. How come? Because you got flesh. And your flesh is constantly at war with your spirit. Your flesh is constantly trying to do the very thing that your spirit man hates. It's just like right now, Brian has me on an eating plan. You can't eat this. You can't eat this. You got to make sure you do this. And I'm watching and I'm looking. But my flesh is like, but that's good. And I love sugar. And I like sugary things. And I like real soda. Real soda. I'm, I'm learning to love sparkling water with flavor, though. It's, it's making, it's saving my life. And even though I know it's killing me, my, my flesh desires it. Interesting how in the natural, it's easy for us to understand, but we don't understand it in the spiritual. How many things do we eat that we know is killing us? But because it's good to us, we'll overlook that it's not good for us. And just as in the natural, it is in the spiritual. There are so many things that God says, I have things for you and things that will kill you. But we still keep choosing it and we rely on grace to live. And Paul really unpacks this with them. And he's like, listen, I want to help you because you might have some idols that are getting in the way. And if you allow those things to stay in the way, here's the result. God is going to let you have what your heart desires. And I know you might think that's a good thing. But what happens when God says yes to what you want? What happens when God says yes to what you think you want now? See, I'm older now. I'm 44. I'm getting close to 50. Not 50. 50. And my gray hairs are coming in. My wife keeps trying to pull them out, but I like them. But one thing I learned as I'm getting older, the things that I never thought I would get over when I was young, I'm over it now. And there was some stuff when I was young that I just said, oh, if I just had this and I just had that. And I think about, imagine where my life would be if I got what I wanted then. Have you ever been in those moments in your life where you look back over those seasons and those prayers that you prayed and you believed God for something and he said no and you were broken? But six months later, six years later, you were like, I dodged a bullet on that one. 
Like some people, you didn't know they were going to turn into a crackhead. They didn't have crackhead tendencies when you were young, but then when you got older, you're like, oh, Leon, hey, what happened? <laughs> you trying to figure out what happened to Shakira. She just, but the reality is you're looking back over your life. Some of y'all are like, ooh, how you know Shakira? Uh, <laughs> but the reality is there are some things that God says no to because he knows what we don't. And there are some things that God doesn't release to us, but, but Paul begins to write to them. He says, okay, you put idols and you put things in place. And as a result of that, watch what God does. So watch what he says in verse 24. In verse 24, uh, he says this. He says, uh, where is it at? Come on, verse 24. There it is. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. And as a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. Oh, my God, this is going to get gross. Uh, the fruit of the faithless. The first thing is God's withdrawal. When you lean into this place of idolatry where you decide, I'm going to consistently make a decision to put things before God or in place of God or equal to God or compare to God, God is going to withdraw. And he says this idolatry that happens when God withdraws, what that really means is that he restrains his influence on your heart. He restrains his influence on your heart, which means that he gave them up. He, gave, he says, you know what? Old school, you can't quit me. I quit you. That's 80s talk right there. I quit you. And, and the thing is about God, he says, I'm going to withdraw. So I'm going to let you pursue whatever your heart wants. And you think it might be good, but watch where your heart leads you. And one of the scariest things for, in your life is for God to let you be God for a day. As to let you have what you think you want. Because the truth is, when we make enough bad decisions, bad decisions have a way of humbling us and bringing us back to a place of understanding. We'll start begging for God to take over again. God, I'm sorry. Your prayer life will change the moment you come to a place where you have to deal with the consequences of your bad decision. But the first place it leads us is, number one, God's withdrawal. Here's the second thing. The second thing we find in verse 25 and 28. In verse 25, it says, they traded. This is key. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. Verse 28 says, and since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do the things that should never be done. Somebody shout never. You have to understand this because idolatry results in a depraved mindset and distorted thinking. And he says that those that exchange the truth of God for a lie, they begin to worship creation and no longer the creator. They started finding things to worship. They started finding things to put first. They started creating idols and doing other things. Okay, let me say it like this. People got so dark that they didn't recognize the, the level of their wickedness. That they were so wicked and blind that they didn't know how wicked and blind they actually were. It's one thing when somebody knows they have a problem but they're struggling. It's another thing when they have a problem that they can't recognize. And it says that their hearts were so seared, that their minds were so debased, that they didn't even recognize where they were spiritually. Wow. Let, let me prove it to you. It was so bad that their minds begin to change about things they already knew the answers to. Because we're dealing with a culture of chaos, some of the things I'm going to share with you is going to paint, paint the picture. Number one, uh, have y'all heard of MAPS? MAPS, the acronym MAPS, M-A-P-S, MAPS. MAPS is not 
you know, going in MapQuest. I'm not talking about that. Some of y'all old school. I'm not talking about MapQuest. I'm not talking about Google search. I'm talking about maps. We're in a culture of chaos. We start redefining things. And in this culture of chaos, we don't have child molesters anymore. We have minor attracted persons. And in some states, because they call it a sickness, they don't call them a child molester and put them in jail. They redefine it so that they can skip jail time and just take medicine because they're a minor attracted person. All right, let me help y'all go further. In New York, you're not born a baby anymore. They don't have it come out, baby come out. What is it? It's a boy. It's a girl. They don't do that no more because they want you to let your child decide what sex it feels like and identifies with. And they don't want you trying to to indoctrinate your child to be limited to something, to your small minded thinking, blue or pink. Boy or girl, no. So we're not going to call a baby a baby. We're going to call them a baby. This is stuff they're teaching your kids in school right now. We got maps. We got babies. Oh, yeah, ladies. And that nine months you did holding that baby inside of you. And then you push that baby out, cut that baby. However you got that baby out, it came out. You're no longer considered a mother. You're a birthing person. Because men can have babies too now. Culture of chaos. We're in a culture that's redefining things. This is why we're confused. And on your emails, it says, he, him, her, they, they, ours, thou, thus. I saw somebody that said we. I'm like, our? I'm, I'm just calling you Mike, man. Mike. And I know some of you, listen, I know some of you are going to be offended. And some of you are going to be bothered. Because you might be in a certain lifestyle or a certain place or have people close to you. This is not a church where we're going to beat you up. We're going to build you up. And so I share this in love. And I share this with, with understanding. But I want to be honest with you. Because if you, can't go, if you can't come to church and get love and honesty, where can you go? This is a trick of the enemy. This ain't nothing but the devil. People walking around confused and fighting about pronouns. And I don't limit me. I'm not a male or a female. I identify. Somebody in my daughter's school identifies as a cat in purrs. They're putting litter boxes in the bathrooms for teenagers. Oh, slap that whisker off you. <laughs> I'm just, you said them. Listen, if my grandmother was a teacher today... Oh, Jesus. We don't need therapy. We need, we need some more grandmothers who prayed and had switches. See, grandmothers today are only 30 years old, but old school grandmothers that wore moo-moos and you never knew how old they were. They were old when you were born. <laughs> they looked like they were born old. That's how you knew you had a good grandmother. If she looked like she was born old, you do. She was saved. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> we got too much foolishness going on. This is also why we have so many males that dress up like women and dominate female sports. You out there 6'9", 280, looking like LeBron, talking about I'm playing women's college basketball. Because I feel like a woman. And here's the, here's the challenge of this. And let me tell you how stupid and demonic this is at the same time. Because you have 13-year-old boys who are like, I just, I feel like I'm a girl inside. And they're like, well, live your truth. Try it out. It's like, well, how do you know what a girl feels like? If you've never been a girl. 
You only know what it feels like to be a boy. Now, you might be a boy that likes girl things. Say that. But debased mindsets create a culture of chaos. And so it leads us to this place where now we're developing in dysfunction. And we have generations of children that it's regular to them. I remember growing up, 80s babies, best television in the world, when wrestling was real and everything. And um, I remember there were certain things that just didn't happen on TV. Matter of fact, it was such a culture, you, you really didn't have cuss words on TV. It would get something cuss-like, but not a cuss. And you'd be like, ooh, and your parents would be like, turn that off. You get close, and if you had a little bit of money, you watch HBO on the low, and that's where you could see the real sin. Sin to the max, HBO, all of that. Back in the day, when you had the A side and the B side. Oh, y'all don't know about no A side, B side. Y'all know about no A side, B side. Anybody in the 30s like, what? What is this A side, B side you speak of? <laughs> oh, anybody ever have the box? See, y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Y'all don't know. Y'all don't know. But you, have, you creep and you watch certain things. I remember to, to get your hands on, we called them dirty books. You have to creep, sneak it in, go into like the woods of New Hampshire to read it. Now kids be like, oh, Instagram. Oh, I'm sorry. You ain't even got to go to a website. You just go right to Instagram. Call it an Instagram model now. It's light porn. We're in a society and a culture of chaos. And I remember there were things that just were detestable. It was even when I was young, even just with, you know, the community. You didn't see a lot of, like, like, like even on television, you didn't see a lot of, like, gay agenda. There'd be, like, one show that had a gay person. And you would know that it was like the gay person, but they would never be out there. And if you saw it, you'd be like, oh, snap, I think. I'm not sure. Now, we see, I remember I was with my kids at Six Flags, and these two big, huge guys, big, thick mustaches kissing. And my kids are like, oh. And they're walking, and they, and they see it. And I'm like, oh, come on, let's go this way. And they're, but watch this. They've been so desensitized. That they're used to it. The things that we never saw, like women back in the day on television, there were certain things to show their body and they have little curves and they show me, you were like, ooh, I know what that's implying. Now, they in there with thongs and G-string, but can't, you can't even tell they got something on. And everything's acceptable. Because we're in a culture of chaos. And if you speak against it, you're a hater. Cancel culture. Everybody's hating everybody. You want everybody to speak their truth but Christians. Number three. Verse 24. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things they wanted to do. So here's the third thing. Immoral, immorality and impurity. To write that down. Because idolatry, it leads to moral degradation. It, it, causes, it causes us to engage in dishonorable passions, including sexual immorality and impurity. Okay, let me say it this way. There's no true morality unless God is the judge. And because of a culture of chaos, the world is trying to tell us that we can be moral without God. And we try to do these arguments. No, you can't. I know what's right. I know what's good. I can do this. And here's the issue. First of all, morality has to come from an authority. And it has to come from an authority that's righteous and above the law. And so when, when, when we, if we were to come together in community and say, okay, let's make some rules. And we make a whole bunch of rules that we think is right and wrong. It would seem good. It would seem like, okay, we're pretty moral people. We're going to, let's write this down. Let's not steal from each other. 
Let's not gossip. Let's not lie. Let's not hurt each other. Let's look out. We have all these nice rules. But then there's going to be somebody who's not from our community who disagrees. And they're going to say, well, I don't think that just a man and a woman should be married. I think a man shouldn't be able, be able to marry five women. Some of the brothers are like, yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> don't just look straight, fellas. If you marry, just look straight. Don't even, don't even do it to yourself. But, but somebody else has a different opinion. So now the question is, who's right and who's wrong? Because if we all become our free moral agents to decide what's right and what's wrong and what's truth, then there's never going to be right and wrong, and there's never going to be truth. It's always going to be subjective. It's always going to be based on how we feel. This is why God sits out of time, and he creates laws and statutes and rules, and we have to live according to those. And when we fall short, we're wrong. When we live according to them, we're right, and it's because God said. And if we leave it to us and our own morality, we'll keep failing. And so the challenge is, the challenge is, because none of us are righteous, None of us really have the ability, other than to agree with God, we can't make up right living. This is, okay, let me prove it this way. This is why to Hitler, he was right. And there were people, believe it or not, that agreed with him. You think people in Germany were fighting Hitler? They were like, huh? They were doing the little signs and, and all the stuff they were doing because they agreed with him. Now, we know it was demonic. We know it was wrong. We know it was sick. We know it was distasteful. We know he had to have a couple of demons in him, a few legions. But there were still people that agreed with him. So if we left morality up to us and not God, then who is to say he was wrong? So we have to make sure that we're keeping God ahead of the culture. Hope this is helping somebody. Here's number four. Got three more for you. Here's number four. In verse 26 and 27. Verse 26 and 27, uh, it says, That is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex instead indulged in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men, and as a result of sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. Here's number four unnatural relations. I told you, it's going to be uncomfortable, but I promise you, we're going to patch it up and you're going to feel good when you leave. Idolatry, it led to unnatural relations and sexual perversion. It's interesting to me that the first thing that they do when God lets them go is go and have sexual imp impurity. So that tells me there's a strong connection between sexuality and spirituality. There's a strong connection there. And we find the first thing that they do is go and try stuff that, that God says shouldn't even be named among them. They, they got so bad. How bad? Let me tell you. They got so bad, they started creating new ways to sin. It's one thing to fall short. It's another thing to go after sin. It's another thing to create ways, and it becomes normal, and their hearts are dark, and their passion. Now, I know some of you are saying, well, I still don't understand, because some people were born with certain passions, and certain tendencies, and certain desires, and certain things that they're attracted to. Cool. Fine. Have it. Be attracted. Desire it. But don't do everything you desire. The issue is not always the attraction. The issue is not always the desire. It's how do you manage your appetite? How are you handling it? Because for you, it's that. For somebody else, it's an animal. Oh, it sounds silly. But there are people in Utah right now married to pigs. I just love Eric. Something about his smooth skin and snort that turns me on. I'm just telling you. 
They wilding in Utah. I had to lighten it for you. But you understand. So, so the issue is you could be broke and desire. I need some money right now like yesterday. So let me go rob somebody real quick. Let me hit a lick. Let me do something so I can get some money. The desire to have money and meet your need is not bad. But if you do everything you feel. So, so God says, when I leave you to yourself, he says, you'll abandon natural relations and engage in homosexual behavior. And he describes it, watch this, as contrary to your nature, which means God says it shouldn't be natural to you. The only reason it is natural because it's natural to your sinful nature, not your saved nature. Well, I'm saved and I still have that desire. Well, you need to ask God to deliver you. See, many of us stop at forgiveness and never move into deliverance. But I want to tell you, whatever it is that you are dealing with, whatever it is you're carrying, doesn't matter if you're sleeping with it, doesn't matter if you're drinking it, doesn't matter if you're smoking it, doesn't matter if you're watching it, doesn't matter if you're buying it. At the end of the day, God is able to deliver you. And I know we're in a culture that waters the power of our God down, but he can do it. And I'm not telling you, every person has the ability to be delivered, but maybe not everybody will be delivered. Because deliverance is going to be based on your heart. Do you really want to? Is it really in you? And until your heart changes about it, your head won't change. So here's the challenge. He, he, he goes in detail and describes their lust and them burning passion to go after things. But here's the thing I want you to consider. You have to make a choice every day, and here's your choice. It's the Lord or the lust. But it's impossible to have both. You can't have the Lord, and you can't have what you lust at the same time. And the struggle for many of us, I promise, when we get to chapter 6 and 7, it's going to be real good because we're going to talk about that struggle. But that struggle is real because the truth is there are some days I want to give fully into my lust. Oh, I know y'all weren't ready for that. There are some days my lust just be calling me and I be gotten, I got to go to it. <laughs> like, what's up, lust? Hey, thinking about you. Watch this. Some days lust don't call me, I call it. And so, so, so the question is, what are you going to choose? And why do you choose who you choose? I choose the Lord or I choose the lust. Let me give you number five. Verse 29 through 31. Is this good to anybody so far? Yeah. I hope I'm helping you. Verse 29 says, their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning, and they disobey their parents. That's interesting how that was added to that, so I hope my kids heard it. They disobeyed their parents. Sorry, that was for them. They refuse to understand, break their promises, are heartless, and have no mercy. Let me give you number five. Number five, write this down, depraved mind. It, it, it leads to a depraved mind and a lifestyle characterized by all manners of evil. So Paul begins to list this and said, when your mind is depraved, there's some things that you're going to do. And my grandmother used to scare me because she used to be like, God's going to turn you over. And she used to call his the big Bible word to a reprobate mind. I'm five going, uh, I'm just scared and crying because, because she's, she's putting it on me and she's telling me God's going to turn me over to something. And, and what he tells us when God releases us to be us, there's a whole bunch of stuff we're going to do. There's a whole bunch of stuff we're going to get into. And so it's a place of moral corruption. It's a place of deep wickedness. And it's our thoughts and our desires. It's not based on, what's it's not based on a response to what's happening around us. It's really about what's happening on the inside of us. Everybody say, my mind is the battleground. 
when your mind is depraved, your mind is the place that the enemy attacks the most and that your flesh attacks the most. Your mind, and you start feeling ways and thinking ways, and you start chasing your feelings and your flesh, and now lust. And here's the challenge about lust. Let me throw lust back in here. Because here's the thing you have to know about lust. Here's the secret power of lust. Lust will never be satisfied. Every time you get into it and give into it, lust wants more. Lust will never be satisfied. And sometimes you might think, I'm going to just give into it this one time. You ever do one of those, this one last time? You ever said that? Just one last time. One time before I go. One more for the road. And then all of a sudden, you find yourself selling your mother's TV. Because you... Because you were giving in. And so this lust thing and this depraved mind is, is interesting. And it reflects, watch this, it reflects the condition of where your moral compass really is. And many of us don't understand how distorted and how absent-minded our hearts are when, when our minds are depraved. And that's when God gives you over to yourself. Here's the last one. I promise this is going to be good. I'm going to let you shout and go home. Uh, we find it in verse 32. In verse 32, uh, it says, They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die. Yet they do them anyway. Worse, they encourage others to do them too. Uh, number six, I want you to write this down. Encouragement, encouragement of sin. It's one thing when you have your own issues. It's another thing when you project your issues on others. It's another thing when you're encouraging someone to do what you know is wrong. And he, he deals with this because he says it's, it's, it's when you're leading individuals into sin and encouraging them to do it. He said because you're giving approval, you're giving the head stamp, you're giving the head nod, and you're telling them go ahead and do it. And the same sin they're falling to, you're now guilty of even if you don't do it with them. And what, God, what God's really trying to get us to understand is that this culture of chaos is doing that very thing. This culture of chaos is encouraging us to do everything that disrespects God. This culture of chaos is trying to get us to be comfortable with no authority, with no accountability, with no love, with no forgiveness. And it's encouraging us to walk in that and applaud it. That's why we love Ratchet TV. Oh, I know you can look straight. Don't even, don't even, don't even try to give me that face like, no, that's not me. Yes, you do. Y'all watch Love and Hip Hop. Y'all watch Housewives of wherever. <laughs> All the Housewives. Some of y'all like me, you watch Tubi movies. Y'all watched Tubi this week, didn't you? Yes, y'all did. Yes, y'all did. <laughs> Watching all the ghetto films. <laughs> but the reality is, the truth is, we like drama when it's not ours. There was one new one that they call it a sport. I think it's drama on the low. That new thing called slap fighting. Y'all be watching that? Anybody seen that? You got to stand there on one side of the table. I wish somebody would. You got to stand there and get the demon slapped out of you. I seen people lose teeth, get knocked out. One guy got up. He was in his childhood. It was crazy. I don't think that's a sport. That's drama. Y'all like watching it. I just want to see who's going to get slapped today. <laughs> but the truth is we're in a culture of chaos, and in this culture, it's really pushing us and encouraging us to do the things that God does not desire us to do. So here's the, the thing is that when you're in a society in a culture of chaos, it's a culture that says that good is evil and that evil is good. So the question is, how, how does this thing get fixed? How do we guard ourselves from it? How do we fight all of this? Because we got all of this. We heard you, Pastor. We heard what Paul said. But how do we fix it? Here's, here's, here's how we fix it. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Second Chronicles 
chapter 7, verse 14. I want everybody to write this down. This is your verse of the week. This is your verse. I want you to study it. I want you to remember it. I want you to get it in your head, your heart, your spirit. Every single person, make sure you write this down. Don't just head nod. Don't just stare at me. Don't just say, I'm going to remember it. No, you ain't. I'm going to ask you after church. You're going to be like, uh, 1 Corinthians. 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Watch what he says. If my people which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now, here's the question. This is Old Testament. So where do I see Jesus in this? Because if we're going to be New Testament, then I need to see Jesus. Well, I told you before that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. And so everything in the Old Testament is pointing to the revelation of Christ in the New Testament. So where do we see Jesus in this? I'm glad you asked. If my people who are called by my name, we are Christians because we follow Christ. We are followers of the way. We're Jesus people. Bump somebody tell them I'm Jesus people. So he says, if the people who follow Jesus would humble themselves, which means the church needs humility. Come on, come on, come on. And the church needs to pray. Yeah, yeah, but he makes a difference. He says, not just pray, seek my face. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I hear you. Don't just settle for his presence. Seek his face. Seek him while he may be found. Go after him. Long for him. That goes further than prayer. Prayer is when you're making your petition, your request known to God. You're speaking to him, and you're listening for him. That's prayer. You talk to him. He talks to you. Hopefully, he's talking to you more than you're talking to him. That's good prayer. But, but seeking God. Seeking his face is spending time in his presence to where you begin to change, where you begin to become more like him, where his influence rubs off on you. It's like if, if, if my wife was cooking that good old fried chicken in the house and you get ready to leave. I was in the kitchen for two seconds and I get to where I'm going and like, you have some fried chicken. And like, ah, oh, my wife got me because I was in her presence. Good, good. Good. I was in an atmosphere where there was an aroma that was so strong that I left under the influence of it. And God wants us to be under the aroma of his presence to where when we leave his influences on us, that people say, you must know Jesus. I can tell in your temperance. I can tell in your tone. I can tell in your posture and your response. There's something. I can smell them on you. He says, and turn from your wicked ways. That means you can be saved and still have some wicked ways. You can belong to God and still have some issues. So he says, turn, which means stop trying to live for me going in the same direction you used to. But turn from your wickedness. Agree with God. And when you do that, watch what God does. He says, then I'll hear you. Maybe you're not heard because you haven't postured yourself properly. He says, I'll hear, I'll hear from heaven. The next best thing God does, he says, I'll forgive your sin. There's nothing like being forgiven. Okay, okay. Have you ever had a bill that you know you didn't pay? And then you checked in and found out it was a zero balance? Oh, Shondo. Mm. That was a shouting moment. Sally Mae, I don't know when I paid you, but when you know you didn't pay it, but the bill was paid anyway. I love it because he says, I forgave you because you couldn't forgive yourself. And then he says, I'll forgive your sin. And that freedom you walked in, when you were, anybody debt-free in the room? Anybody got no debt? Anybody almost debt-free? 
Anybody, anybody practicing being debt free? You just getting ready? There it is. You know that feeling when you don't owe nobody. When that first or 15th comes and you don't got no checks you got to write, no automatic withdrawals coming out. And you think about what you're going to do next with your money because you don't owe nobody that freedom. That's what it feels like when he says you're forgiven. Yeah. I don't have this debt over my head. And lastly, he says, and, and will heal their land. I'll send healing to you. Every broken place in your life, I'll heal it. I'll heal you physically, emotionally, economically, spiritually. Every lee in your life, I'll heal it. And I'll leave you whole. And I'll leave you new. But the chaos and the culture of chaos wants us to be opposite of what God has for us. And so it's our responsibility as believers to make a decision. And all of us in here... We're faced with the decision every day. You're going to be faced with this decision when you leave. Am I going to grow deeper or am I just going to settle for Sunday's message? And that's where we raise it up. And this is why I told y'all last week. I said, for some people, this is going to be their last time at church because they're not going to be into teaching. They just want me to hoop and holler and tell you, God is going to turn it. Sean, what key is that? God is going to turn Is that a key? Is that a real key? Is that a 1464? Is that is that a 146? Give me the 1464. Sorry, that's music musicians talk. For us artists. But y'all want that. Y'all, we want that shout. We want that. And and nothing's wrong with it. But if you don't have anything to hold you when the music stops. If you don't have a God that's good when things aren't good, then you miss the moment. Now, oh. didn't I tell you that was going to be amazing? I hope you took your notes. And if you want to sow a seed in Motivation Church, the giving options are below. We are doing amazing things, and we would love for you to be a part of it. Now, make sure you try to get in the building for our 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. services. We are so excited, and we can't wait to see you there.